You're listening to the Swap Society Podcast, and I'm your host, Nicole Robertson. I interview thought leaders and change makers who are working to create a more sustainable and equitable world through fashion, art, and activism. Join us for a dose of climate optimism as we envision a brighter future. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Swap Society podcast. Today, I'm so excited to be talking with Dr. Joanne Brash, a textiles lecturer and special project manager for the California Product Stewardship Council, an NGO specializing in extended producer responsibility. Dr. Brash also holds two appointments with the California Department of Resources, Recycling and Recovery. Hey, Joanne, welcome to the show. Hi, Nicole. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Where are you talking to us from today and where are you from originally? I'm calling in from Sacramento, California, the capital of the Golden State. And um, I'm originally from a small town that's been globally impacted by climate change. You might know it as Paradise, California, home of the (sighs) campfire. That's my home. That's my heart um, and and part of my passion for to assist with recovery. Wow. Wow. (laughs) Not to start on a heavy note or anything. (laughs) But I'm sure that really has tied into the work that you do in so many ways. So I'm and I'm excited to learn more about that. Tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to work in the textile industry. Absolutely. So uh, I have a PhD in textile economics. I'm the only person in the country that has this PhD because it was an individual program. So at the time, um, I was studying the the intersection of policy, global production, and, and kind of the human factors within the global supply chain. And um, so my options for PhDs were either to go like science and chemistry or, or to go more of the arts, but I wanted to stick with policy. So I actually did an individual program. I was sponsored by three different departments and it really opened doors. I would say if I was doing a PhD today, I'd probably be housed under like industrial ecology. But how I got into textiles, because I, I actually started in agriculture, um, but I like to say hemp was my gateway fiber <laughs> and, and kind of looking at the, the global supply chains for agricultural products really opened my eyes to the magnitude of this particular industry, mm-hmm. um, looking from, from fiber to fashion to the end of life. And honestly, I I didn't really get involved in waste specifically until pretty much the end of my PhD when I realized um, if we wanted to create a circular economy, the biggest barriers were were ultimately policies. Mm. That's that's good to think about for sure. And I love that you started from an agricultural point of view uh, because so much of the pollution that comes from the fashion industry actually starts at the growing of the fibers from water usage or the dyeing process. When you look at the full supply chain of making a textile, from your perspective, where do you think the majority of the pollution comes from? So, you know, what I've seen in the research and across the life cycle assessments, the the biggest impact really is in the fabric fiber, yarn and fabric productions. Mm -hmm. Um, But the way it works in reality is, you know, we work on what we're paid to work on. So my job is to work on waste. So Mm -hmm. arguably in my world, in my job, that's the biggest source of pollution. And, And when we talk about pollution, we're talking about, you know, macro, micro and nano pollution coming from this product type. Um, But that being said, I'd say in the life cycle assessment, the science is showing the upstream burden as being the largest. Mm -hmm. Um, But my role at CPSC is to really um, get the industry involved upstream so that Mm -hmm. the downstream management in the waste programs is easier. Sure. So textile waste is a mounting problem around the world. Uh, We often share a stat from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation that every second a garbage truck of textiles is landfilled or incinerated. How big of a problem is textile waste in California specifically? Yeah, you know, the deeper and deeper we're digging into getting firsthand evidence and data on the problem, the bigger and bigger the problems really surmounting to be. Um, One of the things, uh, the the 
most commonly California specific citation for textile waste is coming out of cow recycle. You mentioned my appointments to the advisory committees. Uh, so that's a government agency. We call them cow recycle, but they're the Department of Resources and Recovery. So cow recycle does a study every four years of, of what's going to the landfill. And these are point source studies. So they are mm -hmm. studying at the MRFs, at the landfill drop-offs. Um, and what they found over the last two studies is that textiles is one of the fastest growing categories. It's also about 3% of the total landfill stream. Mm. Um, that being said, CPSC does have some pilot projects that are funded by local government. Mm -hmm. so Cal Recycle is a state agency, but something like LA Sanitation, that's a local government agency. And they paid us at CPSC to go in and kind of study the text, the composition of their waste stream um, and not just see what percentage of textiles there is, but also like what kind of fiber types are there. Mm. We know fibers matter with textiles and, and waste characterizations just categorize as product types. Mm -hmm. So what we found in the Los Angeles study was actually textiles were about 6% of the total landfill stream, about 2% of the recycling stream. And I say recycling as a contaminant. Mm -hmm. You don't have textile recycling. So when we see textiles in the plastic recycling stream, it's a contaminant and it's actually expensive to, to remedy that. Um, so what we, we're finding in LA is it's a massive volume going to the landfill, a massive source of contamination in our recycling streams. And ultimately, again, this is at the macro level. The research isn't taking it down to uh, microfibers and, and chemical uh, contaminations mm -hmm. that are happening. Yeah, I've heard there's a stat, I think it's from the EPA from 2018, that about 7% of all municipal solid waste is textile waste. I know that that's like an older statistic, but that seems in line with that LA statistic being about 6%. And that's so interesting that so much clothing is winding up in the recycling bins uh, that must tangle up the machines, because I know that plastic bags like plastic film is often a problem um, going through the MRFs as well when they're going for sorting and, and making a mess of things. So for anyone listening, please stop wish cycling and don't put textiles in yeah. your recycling. I mean, our systems are made for hard plastics and, and clothing. It tangles, it absorbs mm. and it combusts. No one wants to talk about the fires, but um, if it's not batteries, it, it's probably textiles that are in our recycling stream that are causing major fires that are expensive and dangerous, um, obviously. Um, but yeah, when, when we look at the opportunities, I mean, we'll get into opportunities soon, but first, before we move into opportunities, we have to study the problem. So mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the city of San Francisco, they tried putting textiles with their recycling bins curbside. They said, put it in a bag, we'll pull it out. Mm. The bags are ripping. And again, it's absorbing your leftover food and it's absorbing other, you know, liquids. So it ended up being an absolute failure. And, and their only solution was to do appointment based pickups. So as a city, they're paying $60 per pickup for a bag of clothing. So what? again, <laughs> looking, relying on curbside and relying on our government to collect textiles for recycling is not the solution. Wow, that just blew my mind a little bit. <laughs> that is so expensive. Wow. Okay. All right. <laughs> but it's a good transition to what EPR is because ultimately, I mean, our recycling programs are government run. You know, the materials are oversought by the government, the money is oversought by the government. And what EPR does is it, it takes the government out of the management role. It is a program that is ultimately designed by the industry. It's funded by the industry and it's managed by the industry. Mm -hmm. You know, the products better than our government. Our government doesn't know what's in our fabrics. They don't know how to sew and how to, you know, recommend upcycling designs. You know, that's ultimately the role of the, the industry and the wonderful businesses within it. So that leads us to talking about SB 707. Uh, tell us how SB 707 will help create a circular economy for textiles in California. Absolutely. Um, so extended producer responsibility is a very specific waste policy model. Mm 
Uh, here in California, we have 14 different varieties of EPR for different products, and each program's a little bit different. But the theory and the philosophy of EPR is it's a recycling fee that's paid by the industry. And it's paid by the producer associated with that product. Mm -hmm. And that money goes to a PRO, which is a producer responsibility organization. The PRO is the one running the recycling program. Mm -hmm. So under EPR, the money never goes to the state and the materials never go to the state. And the way EPR has been shown to really drive a circular economy is it unlocks some of the biggest barriers, right? It brings around collaborative solutions. It brings pooled funding sources. It brings uh, oversight and transparency to parts of the industry that we've never even gotten data on. So we can go into a little bit more of the details moving forward, but basically it sets up a vehicle for the industry to work together to solve systematic problems like blended fibers and, you know, what can we do for upcycling to scale and things like that. It's such a massive problem. It's even, I mean, even having these conversations with people like yourself or, you know, everybody's that we talk with, everybody's working on a different slice of the pie, yeah. uh, but it's, it's such a vast problem that's been created. Um, and obviously we all need textiles. We need clothing. We need towels. We need sheets. We need all of those sorts of things. But certainly with the rise of overproduction and overconsumption, it seems like you know, we're just buying way more than we need, not wearing stuff or using stuff as much as we should be. And then, you know, now we have this, you know, this downstream problem. You know, you did mention textile recycling. And so let's talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, I've heard the stat that globally less than 1% of textiles are recycled, um, you know, considering the myriad barriers uh, to textile recycling from the challenges of sorting, fabric identification, mixed fibers. Do you envision a future where recycling is a viable solution to our growing textile waste problem? Well, first of all, we can't really calculate a percentage if we don't know how much is actually produced or how much is actually total collected. So I always take those numbers with a grain of salt because in order to get a percentage, you need a denominator. And that has to be like a, how much was produced. And we don't know. Um, and ultimately, I, what I've heard is the 1% is textile to textile. I, I think there's a lot of processes in place to downcycle, to make it into shoddy, to make it into insulation. But let me tell you, every product that has no upcycle or high value market is going to be fighting to be insulation. You know, carpet can be insulation. Um, old furniture fluff can be insulation. That's the easy solution. And ultimately, mechanical recycling has been around for, for decades, centuries, really. Um, so when we talk about recycling in the context of an EPR program, it's really looking at, at scalable solutions and, and unlocking the barriers, which in California, is transportation, storage, and the labor for sorting. So ways that we can mechanize it or ways that we can use our funding to support the sorters in other states and other countries um, who are ultimately doing a lot of this work anyways. But to, again, equitably have the money flow with the materials. Um, so as much as we want to see more recycling accessible, the, the really key things is Access to who? I mean, we need public access. The public needs to know if they take their unusables to a thrift, it will make it to a recycler and not in a mixed bale in the secondhand market. We need the reassurance and the accountability that the companies who are claiming to be recyclers are actually modifying those fabrics into new products. And again, not just mixing it into a bale and dumping it in the secondhand market. So what EPR does, it doesn't solve everything. It truly doesn't. But again, it's a vehicle. And, and what we get uh, is not only access by the public, um, convenient access to drop off your unusables. It also brings a level of transparency and reporting that has never been achieved in the production of new goods and also the trade and material flows post-consumer. 
Um, this helps us understand where the best interventions are, where the best financial support are, is in order really, uh, like I said, lift those barriers and kind of release those market levers. There are obviously some places around the world where a lot of Western clothing donations to thrift shops or otherwise are, you know, as you mentioned, are bailed up and shipped away um, to places like Accra and Ghana or the Atacama Desert in Chile. Do you have a sense of because you're doing all this research, I don't I don't know if you have any stats around this, but do you know how much clothing is getting bailed up in California and shipped to other countries? Again, it's a big mystery that no one knows, but so we don't know what's being produced. We don't know how much is truly being collected, but what we're seeing is the accumulation of textiles along the life cycle. And it's through studying those points of accumulation um, that we can really understand kind of those flows, mm -hmm. but without that data and uh, without any type of oversight for those data and reporting, um, we truly don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and, and those images are just heartbreaking. I mean, they're just walking out with their cameras and, and that's their everyday life. And just as a reminder, you know, our landfills in California are very tightly regulated. How they're lined, how we test the water that leaches from it, how we test the air right above the landfill. Mm -hmm. If we are ultimately shipping textiles to be landfilled in other countries that don't have those same protections, we're not only shipping the burden, we're shipping the risk and ultimately the contaminations as well. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, that's important to think about also. Yeah, I mean, and when you do see photos and videos from these places, it really is heartbreaking uh, on so many levels to see what you know, and, and now the term that's being used is waste colonialism, you know, this idea that we're just pushing our trash in other places where, to your point, they don't necessarily have the infrastructure to deal with it in in a great way. And so it can create all of these other problems. Um, and it is astounding, though, to think about, you know, I've heard the stat that it, I've heard a few different stats, but, um, you know, anywhere from like 100 billion to 150 billion articles of clothing are produced every year, just some like a crazy big number, right, where it's like, we, you know, or that we have enough clothing on Earth right now for the next six generations. And, you know, these companies keep producing, you know, without any real thought about that, right? How much regulation it will really be imposed upon these apparel companies with something like SB 707. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Uh, great question. So SB 707 and EPR, it's truly a waste program. So there are no mandates on production. There are no uh, mandates on green design in our model, but there's incentives. Mm. Um, and so we, we really look at what can we do within this vehicle to have the greatest influence and to use this money most equitably. Um, and so we talked about, you know, some of the shipments and some of the um, other countries who are doing a lot of the sorting. And under the proposal of SB 707, the money flows with whoever's doing the work. So if these mixed bales are coming from California and they have unusable or, you know, not wearable items, in theory of this practice, passes, the money will be there to actually support the sorting, support the, the repair and recycling, because ultimately we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. These are markets around the world that have been doing this for centuries and, and utilizing the skills and the people in Accra and in Chile to help with the solution that they're already doing is kind of the goal instead of really reinventing, you know, what's what's the best solution. So SB 707 gives everyone along the supply chain access to the funding and access to um, not just the recycling, but 707 has a major repair component. Within that definition of repair, we have upcycling, we have cleaning with microfiber filtration, we have a surface repairs, mending, redying, all of these methods that keep the materials as materials. So you're not actually recycling it at the yarn or fiber level, but actually investing more money into the alterations and modifications at the garment and fabric level. Mm 
at those higher levels, you're doing less energy, less interventions, and ultimately you're giving more money to using the fabrics that we already have in the world. So I, I know there's so many stats out there, but I truly believe we have enough materials in our in our economy and in the world to really have collections come out. And they can this doesn't stifle fashion. This doesn't stifle innovation. Actually, Reformation, the brand, they've recently endorsed SB 707, and they sit on our textile advisory committee. Um, recently, I love this quote. They said 707 is a new wave of creativity for sustainable fashion. It gives designers, artists, and even transnational brands access to materials, designers, and, and processes like recycling uh, to a scale and capacity that they really haven't been able to do individually. There is so much creativity happening. The upcyclers and the refashioners, they're, you know, it's really incredible what they can do. And and I love seeing that there's a growing wave of mending, uh, but it is harder to scale, right? It is, it is harder for brands to scale this type of thing or for companies to scale that, or even what we're doing where we're basically re-commerce with our own little spin on it. But we have worked with a lot of upcyclers. So the things that don't pass the cut to make it into our swap, we pass it on to different designers that are upcycling the items, but it really is a one-off thing. You have to, you know, have a team of people that have the time to really dive into each thing. But hopefully uh, we can see more and more of that in the future. I would love to see that. Yeah, absolutely. We had a pilot project in San Francisco and it was with Goodwill. And what we basically did is finding those higher value items that were kind of worth repairing. And we did uh, surface repairs, cleaning and redesign. Mm. Uh, we got to work with some amazing different garment workers. Um, in California, there's a law about licensed garment workers, equitable pay support. Um, so it was like our pleasure to do those kind of partnerships because what it really shows is the potential for domestic manufacturing and any kind of manufacturing with these uh, repurposed materials. And, and one of the outcome, outcomes was some of the designers we worked with now have template upcycle designs because oh. they saw what sold, they saw what materials, and they have a better uh, way to kind of turn things down that really they know downstream like won't sell or things, you know, won't work out. So I think the opportunity, I honestly think a major part of the solution is going to come from the creatives and the artists. Mm -hmm. We need more of it. We need more art. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Back to SB 707, would it impact only companies based in California or would it also impact companies selling in California? How would that work? So under the definition of producers, it's pretty much anyone who's putting clothing or textiles into the California market. Okay. Um, it's it's equitable no matter where they're based. Mm -hmm. um, the way d producers is defined is, you know, obviously the manufacturer. But if if they're not paying into the solution or into the program, then mm -hmm. it falls on the importer. If the importer doesn't uh, pay the fees, then the responsibility falls onto the license holder or, you know, the brand. Okay. So the way we've set it up is the same for other EPR programs, because a lot of times you know, brands are just contracts. <laughs> so finding uh, who's going to pay in is also incentivizes brands to pick factories who, mm. who decided to pay in. So there's a lot of ways that brands, if they don't want to pay in, you can find a factory that has taken that responsibility. Interesting. So again, it's not a mandate. It's a lot of incentives. And if someone's not falling, paying for the fee and taking responsibility, it actually never falls on the, the retailer. The fines are never applied to the retailers, but if a retailer is caught selling a brand who's not in, not in compliance, mm. the fee then goes back to that brand, not the retailer. So there's a lot of opportunities for our retailers and our stores to get engaged and, and to really kind of offer those sustainable options because there's going to be a clear list of, you know, which brands are approved and, and have paid in. The other thing is we don't mandate retailers to take back clothes. Um, we can't force them, you know. I don't think Gucci wants a big bin in their lobby. <laughs> and I don't think a lot of people, you know, a lot of stores have really tight footprints. 
So that's not the solution is mandating someone to a brand or a company to do something that really doesn't work in their model. So the collection mandates are a performance measure. And what that means is within a county, there has to be X number of collection points, mm. whether it's at a thrift store, whether it's at, you know, city hall, there might be a bin. There's a lot of flexibility on how our communities reach that collection, but ultimately the responsibilities on the industry to make sure our public has convenient access to this program. Got it. Very cool. And on that note, you know, what can individuals do at home to reduce textile waste? We talked about, please don't throw your old textiles in the recycle bin, but, and it sounds like this program would make sure there were more take back centers. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, any suggestions of what people can do? Oh yeah. Like clear as day, buy less, repair more. <laughs> um, <laughs> But you know, sometimes buying is an option. I personally just had a baby and I need some new work clothes that, that really <laughs> fit in my, my new body type and my confidence level. And so finding the brands that really align with what you want. And, and sometimes it might not be recycled content. It might be, you know, you're traveling and you found this beautiful boutique and, and there are some handmade items that might be polyester, it might be not recycled content, but in that moment when you're making that decision to buy to really think about it what does this purchase serve in my life how many uses will i get out of it if it's just kind of solving that itch to like get something new it's not worth it but if you you connect with an item and you say you know this would mesh well with my wardrobe oh i could see myself testifying in the capital in this you know, <laughs> buying an item without guilt and knowing that you're buying from a retailer or a brand that has taken the steps for you to be responsible, to design for, you know, end of life and circularity. Um, it's just, you know, the best option. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's true. I mean, our bodies change, our wardrobes need to change either if our size changes uh, or if, you know, our job changes or our lifestyle or whatever. I mean, there there are times when we need change. And then there are also people that just like variety in their wardrobe. So I think that just doing it as responsibly as possible and, you know, not just treating clothing as disposable, because I think that's just become a thing, like wear something once or twice and get rid of it. And it's like, no, 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 please. Yeah. <laughs> I've done the rental thing. You know, it doesn't always fit when it shows up at home and I love secondhand, but you know, sometimes, you know, it's not the right color or it really isn't the fit for, you know, whatever context I'm wearing. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, you know, I really look for quality. I need to wear this suit every day for the next, you know, X years um, and finding as many natural fibers. Once you start looking for natural fibers only, you're going to realize how hard it actually is. Um, and so it's just, it's kind of a fun treasure hunt for me. Like where can I find the most natural fabrics? Yeah. So many fabrics are blended. So even if you think you're finding something that's all natural fiber, it might have an acetate lining in there. You know, we've seen some of that come through our swap where it's even that, well, on older garments, it'll say 100% virgin wool. And then it's like, but this is definitely an acetate lining in this jacket. Yeah. <laughs> that is not wool. And our labels are federally regulated. They haven't been updated since the 70s and they don't legally have to announce anything less than 5%. So, you know, there's a lot of problems that we, we could have a whole podcast on just that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we could. <laughs> yeah, it's so interesting. Well, and I've uh, we actually talked to um, some people in the UK who have a fabric scanner to help with sorting. Um, but one of the things that we talked about in that episode was just how the more fibers you have the, in the blend, the, the more impossible it becomes to identify what all of those things are, but, and then of course, also it's not possible to recycle it. So I guess there are some, at least in Europe, there are some entities that are trying to get brands to only use up to two fibers uh, in a blend, which that's not where we're at right now. So it will be interesting to see how that evolves over time as well. 
Yeah, and, and you know, the policy space is so different in Europe than it is in the United States. And in California, we like to think we, we lead in a lot of options, but I will say legislation is like a full contact sport here. Um, <laughs> and we love the public process. We love democracy, but it means you got to, you know, get tough. You got to get active and you have to stay active. Um, also, the thing with European laws, they're hard to change once they're established if there's any problems. Hmm. With the legislative process in California, we find a problem with the program, we can change it the very next year. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing a lot of pushback to 707? In EPR history in all of California, we have no opposition on record as of the, earlier this week. Wow. Um, which is very rare. When you look at other product types, you know, we did have manufacturers and brands. But what we see in this product specifically is the brands and the companies want it. They want the recycling. They want the sustainability. And so we've seen a lot of engagement from the industry groups in a very positive way. The American Apparel and Footwear Association, a big thank you. They're neutral on the bill, but neutral and active is very appreciated because that <laughs> means they're engaged. That means it's a conversation. And that's what EPR is. It's a conversation of how can we constantly keep updating this program um, and so with 707, we've engaged textile exchange, we've engaged the textile recycling, or sorry, uh, Tursa, it's the, they're, they're in the um, hospitality kind of washing machine. So we've engaged a lot of industry groups, we've engaged individual brands, we have about 10 brands who've endorsed individually uh, 707. And to be honest, it, it's not even that there's resistance, there really are just really great suggestions. As we've been meeting with industry groups, um, a lot of them have suggested amendments, um, including groups like the OR Foundation out of Ghana. And I will say every single suggestion we've gotten to date has made it better. Great. So it's definitely an invitation to any of your listeners, anyone who wants to be engaged in the policy process, what you do is you just read the bill and let me know what you think. It's as simple as that. Awesome. That sounds great. <laughs> so uh, just really quickly back to the individual level for a moment for items that aren't wearable. I mean, obviously, you know, we can talk about, you know, if you have a ripped jacket mended instead of tossing it or, you know, get something cleaned or, you know, all of, there's like kind of that level buy buy less, buy better, you know, all of those things are great tips, but in the state of California, what do you recommend right now at this point in time that people do with textiles that are no longer usable or wearable? This is so tough because um, I get I just had a baby recently and we are with the end of the line for all the hand me downs. We ruined everything. <laughs> um, so to be honest, I don't trust people who claim that they're recycling. So. I will use it as a rag. I will use it to clean something outside and then throw it away. Um, I will say there's a company like For Days. I have reached out to them. I'm not uh, paid enough to endorse them. And I will say I have major questions on what they're doing on the back end. But from what I found, um, at least for the cottons, that, that might be the best option right now, unfortunately, is going to the East Coast. So it's a big shipment here in California for some trash. But um, unfortunately, that's, in my opinion, the best option. Sure. Yeah, yeah, it's it's tough. I mean, and I, and I think that when you look at how recycling is for rigid plastics, for example, and how that's not even as successful as it needs to be when you think about what's actually getting recycled versus not. I don't think that we can just rely on recycling as the solution. So I love that there's going to be such an emphasis on reuse and repair and upcycling because I think that there's just so much more possibility moving in that direction. Recycling as hard as it is, but recycling a blended fiber, forget it. I mean, I know there are some companies working on chemical separation for that sort of thing, but but then I also think, well, if you're chemically separating it, well, where, where does that where does that go? What what happens with those chemicals and how much water does that take? And you know <laughs> the water. It's always about the water. <laughs> They're most precious here. resource. Don't 
mess it up. <laughs> I know. Yeah. As a, as a fellow Californian, I'm always thinking about water. It's like, it's so stressful. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things though, that, you know, obviously we all wear clothes and whether you're a fashion lover or not, everybody wears something, right? So, and I always love to ask, do you have a favorite piece in your closet? And if so, what do you love about it? Thank you. I wore it today. This is actually, I call it my trash shirt. <laughs> I literally found it in the trash bin at a music festival. <laughs> it was covered in wine and it was like 20 years ago. So it was like when chambray <laughs> shirts were just starting to get popular. I'm like, the wine came out in the first wash and I have literally, it's a really thick denim. Mm. It's a men's cut. So it's like nice and slouchy. It's got the roll sleeve and it, I'm not even joking. I have washed this multiple times a week for the last 20 years and I don't see a significant wear and tear. Uh, love my dress shirt. Probably <laughs> would have bought it given that it's like a men's denim shirt, but it has been a big part of my life especially <laughs> in the pandemic you can wear it over pajamas you can wear it over a suit it works the same <laughs> I love that I have to confess I have picked up try have had you know seen clothes in the trash that I have salvaged so I I really appreciate that I think most people probably wouldn't go that route but the fact that that became like your favorite shirt that's, <laughs> that makes it even better I love it well and denim is so durable it's like that is one of the most durable fabrics we just talked about that with a denim uh, designer and you know we we got a little bit deep on that but yeah I mean it it really can last for so long if you take care of it yeah <laughs> and it's repairable so like when I do get a little hole I don't have any yet but I already know I'm going to do some visible mending and yeah plans for this shirt <laughs> yeah you know there's that sashiko mending which is Japanese and then there I think it's called boro mending where it's like more embroidery there's so much cool stuff happening in the mending world that you know that are based on very old traditions but that uh -huh. are becoming popular here now and we see old traditions like most of our communities have tailors and most of our communities have these businesses already so um, yeah looking at ways to really tap into you know the history and the knowledge that our communities already have yeah i mean most dry cleaners have tailors i i feel like almost every you know on the west side of la where i am almost every dry cleaner has a tailor there so you know we often will take things to our local dry cleaners to get mended if it, i'm not a great seamstress so i feel like it's better <laughs> to put it in the hands of a qualified professional you know um i also learned recently and this kind of blew me away uh nordstrom will actually let people take things into their seamstresses it's not just for things that you buy there but you can actually go and hire nordstrom tailors to I something. believe it because you know what I learned recently? Nordstrom is the largest employer of garment workers in the country. Wow. <laughs> Through their tailors and seamstresses. Yeah. Yeah. I just saw, you know, <laughs> someone that we know in the sustainable fashion world posted about it and it was like, wait a second, what? That just kind of blew my mind. It never occurred to me. I mean, a lot of the department stores have their own seamstresses, but I guess in my mind, I always felt like they were really just there to serve the customers of those stores, I didn't realize that, I, I guess, at least Nordstrom, maybe some other ones will let you bring in your stuff and, and hire them. Who knew? I think the most sustainable brands and the adaptable brands are going to start offering services like that. Custom fitting and, and those kind of ser sustainability services. Mm -hmm. um, it's really how they're going to stay relevant mm -hmm. if overproduction is, you know, addressed in the long run. So. Um, yeah. Very cool. What's inspiring you right now? You know, like I said, the artists, I just, and not just in textiles, believe it or not, I work in like solar panel reuse. I work in like propane cylinders. And when I get into these projects where we are finding like who's doing the reuse, who's doing the creative upcycling, every single time I meet someone new, like a new artist or a new creative, I am just so inspired because they're truly the ones doing the work and oftentimes not getting credit or paid. So uh, I, that's what I love about our projects is really cutting the checks for those type of people who, um, you know, doing the work and really diversion from the landfill is as simple as, you know, 
sewing and, and mending. <laughs> so it, it's really fun. Like I said, with my job, getting to cut the tech for those businesses and, and showing them that kind of not just love and appreciation, but actually giving them money for, mm -hmm. for doing what everyone says in their sustainability reports they want done. Yeah. Yeah. I know. That's so great. And, you know, in this time of climate anxiety, which you know, where we keep hearing all of these dire reports, the most recent IPCC report, for example, that we're not hitting our targets, uh, and et cetera. I don't know. I read all of this news and it, it does impact me. Um, and it sounds like for you, you know, it's also hit very close to home for you as well. What makes you feel optimistic about the future? Um. Honestly, I would just say my baby, you know, I, I don't want to be cliche, but she's so cute. She's five months old. And for the oh. first time, I'm just seeing like why things need to be better in five years, why things need to be even better in 10 years. And um, I will say when you work in the wonderful world of waste, uh, we've been very pessimistic for decades because it doesn't stop. No matter what laws we pass, no matter what projects we do, we're constantly surrounded by more and more trash. So um, I find optimism in just the inspiration of, of finding new businesses, new models, new systems that we can subscribe to so that my daughter doesn't have to think so hard about <laughs> what clothes she wants to wear. <laughs> oh, I love it. Oh, in five months. Oh, that's such a good age, like four to six months. They're a little they're a little more solid, you know, but they're still babies and squishy, you know? <laughs> oh yeah. There's, and you know, she, um, we have a lot of hand-me-downs. We have a lot of reuse that happens and uh, we're surrounded by a lot of friends with good taste. So we're really excited for the opportunity to <laughs> pass things down after we use them as well. Yeah, I know. That's so great. Yeah. My kids, almost never get brand new clothing. I mean, it's so rare that they get something brand new. Every once in a while, I, if they ask for something, I'm just, you know, sometimes I'm like, okay, you know, I have to just say in my mind, like 99.5% of their wardrobes are secondhand. If they occasionally want a random t-shirt, I'm just going to have to be okay with it. You know, I don't want to be too crazy, but, but yeah, <laughs> no, the kids, they don't need brand new clothes. I don't need new brand new clothes. I stopped buying brand new stuff in 2010, you know, I haven't missed anything. <laughs> I'm so wow. close. You still have great style. <laughs> still have great clothes and always have something to wear. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, okay. So how can people learn more about the work that you're doing and get involved? Yep. We have a website, calpsd.org. We're on, um, Instagram and Facebook, we're publicly funded trash nerds. So we're not like the <laughs> coolest on social media, but we try. I would say our best asset is our listserv. If you contact us, getting on our listservs, that's where we email our call to actions. Um, but if you go to our social media, you can find like how to sign on to the SB 707 coalition letter of support. We have 65 businesses who've signed on and, and my goal personally is by August to get us to 100. So uh, going to our social media, getting on our listservs, um, but it could be as simple as um, for those who are in California, calling your state legislators telling them, hey, you might not know this, but textiles are a big deal. And, and something as simple as that, as a phone call that's less than five minutes. And if you're not in California, you can still do that. I know there's a couple of bills in New York and Maryland. I've been told by Washington and Minnesota, they want to do something like SB 707. So um, getting involved in your advocacy groups. CPSC, we lead in EPR, but in our network is Fashion Revolution, Remake. We have, you know, work with the Garment Workers Center, you know, in certain capacities. So, you know, finding who to tap into for that source of information locally. So we're, you know, try to lead in California, but I know there's different groups in other states. So uh, getting involved and, and funding them if you can, but at the end of the day, um, your voice is more important. I love it. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today and sharing your wealth of knowledge. 
Uh, and we will definitely help spread the word. And I, I hope you do get to 100. We'll certainly sign on as well. And I, I just hope you have a beautiful rest of your day. Thank you so much. And thank you to your listeners. And I, I hope to connect soon. Thank you for listening to the Swap Society podcast. Swap Society is an online clothing swap for women and kids that makes it easy and affordable to mix up your wardrobe sustainably. We're a growing community of women across the USA who are creating positive change by swapping our clothes and slowing down our fashion consumption. We would love to swap with you. If you're interested in joining, you can sign up at our website. Learn more at www.swapsociety.co. That's swapsociety.co. You can find the show notes for each episode on our website. Please get in touch with us on social media too. We're on Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest, and YouTube for the video version of this podcast at Swap Society. Music is by Joel Korlitz and yours truly. I hope you've enjoyed the show. Please help us spread the word by subscribing, leaving a rating and review, sharing on social media, or simply telling a friend. We really appreciate your support. Have a wonderful day. And remember to swap before you shop.